Um, so I'll just start talking. Um, everyone, welcome to the uh, Maple uh, Applications of Maple session, the second session for um, Tuesday, November 2nd um, for the Maple Conference 2021. Um, um, and uh, welcome everyone. And this is, um, my name is Austin Roche. I'm from MapleSoft. Um, and this is the, the Q&A session for Maple in Education. Uh, sorry, in the Applications of Maple. Um, every, each presenter will have 10 minutes uh, to give um, their presentation, a brief overview of their presentation and take questions. Uh, so the 10 minutes includes the questions and uh, we have some remaining time at the end, hopefully, and you can ask questions again for any presenter at the end. Um, the, the full presentations will be available as recordings in theater and um, questions should be asked through the Q&A uh, panel that there's a, there's a chat window. Um, and uh, so we'll just start with the first speaker. Um, first speaker is uh, Thomas Schramm um, and he will be presenting, um, okay, here we go. Um, he will presenting, be presenting a talk um, lost it now. Should I help? Yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't okay. have a, the name of your talk as is, is in a different window. So, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's clear that uh, the name of my talk is a little bit weird, um, but it's a direct translation of my thesis. Um, made 35 years ago. And I come back to this since I see my retirement coming and uh, I try to fix loose ends. And so I recalculated everything using Maple. And so uh, I open my screen for you. And where is it? It's here. Number three, one moment. And do you see it right now? Yeah. Do you, see my, do you see yeah. my maple screen? Yeah. Yes, we see. Okay, great, great. Um, so it's uh, what it's all about. The medium is the message. So I use the, the maple feature for presentation. I have just to press 11 F, uh, 11, uh, F11. So this talk is about a re-implementation of my research done 35 years ago. And I recalculated everything in maple. The astrophysical background is the important gravitational lens effect, like bending of distant light sources as quasars by foreground masses as stars or galaxies. But the method shown can also be applied to study light propagation in irregular media, for example, for visualization, at least in the thin lens approximation. And the methods can of course be used to study local and global properties of plane to plane map mappings. Let's have a look to the astrophysical background. The upper left shows a general situation where a bright background source, a quasar, shines its light through a foreground galaxy and is then seen by an observer on multiple, uh, uh, on multiple places. The right-hand image shows that we really observe such cases, the Einstein cross, four images of a quasar seen through a galaxy. The last image shows that also whole galaxies could be lensed to arcs by a foreground mass, a galaxy that could be hardly seen without these effect. We model this effect by mapping, by a mapping from um, a lens or a deflector plane to an observer or similar to the source plane. We follow the case where we study the lens action of a star in a galaxy. The right hand side shows the general situation. There are multiple light paths possible and the observer could see multiple images of a source as you see if we are looking from the bottom here and here. 
To study the mapping, we use the conformal command from Maple, which maps an orthogonal grid by a complex version of our lens mapping. Depending on the galactic parameter, it shows the brightness or caustic pattern in the observer plane. If the observer moves across her plane, the number and the brightness of the images of the source change when crossing the sharp boundaries. Explore is a wonderful tool to play around with the parameters and coordinates to see what's happened. And you can do this at home um, to study the lens effect. We can make our own lenses, uh, which have exactly the same properties as um, uh, a star or a planet-like lens. For instance, if you condense the Earth inside this black little black dot as a black hole, then this plastic lens has exactly the same geometrical and optical features. And we see here this bright caustics occurring. But we can do this also a little bit less sophisticated using the foot of a broken wine glass. And if you let the shine, the, li the light shine through, you see the same uh, caustic pattern there. But where are the images? What would an observer see of a point source through the lens? To answer this, we need to invert the lens equation, which for a general lens needs to be done numerically. However, we are lucky to find a polynomial version of our equation. To solve the deflector coordinates, for the deflector coordinates, we use the resultant method to get a fourth order polynomial, showing, showing uh, that we can have up to four images uh, of the point source. The implicit 3D plot command gives us a geometric insight um, into why and where the different numbers of images occur. And if we look from the top, we find again the caustic features. To examine these sharp, bright curves, which are called bifurcation curves or caustics, and uh, inspired by this geometrical view, we can use the discriminant of the resultant to isolate the caustic curves and find, depending on the parameters, a diamond, two angles, or even a hole where a shadow is in the inner region. But how to go on further? What to do with extended sources? For extended sources, the inversion procedure has to be applied to every point on the source. But there's another method called ray tracing. The general strategy in ray tracing is to follow a light ray backwards to the light source and color the starting point with a point hit in the source. You see it sketched here. And uh, we do it a little bit different. And we do it for not for only pixels, but for the whole source uh, at once. Because if the source is given by an intensity function in the source coordinates, we can simply replace the source coordinates by our lens mapping and find an intensity function in the lens plane. This is the image of the source. This holds because the isophotes are mapped onto isophotes. This reads rather obvious, but it took us several days to realize that this was the case. We show an example. We show an example for, for a Gaussian source lined up directly behind the lens. This is a quite good model for a star or for, for the core of a galaxy. We see four distorted images of it. Of course, we can do this better and we can do, do an animation using Maple and just see what happens if a source moves behind the lens and we see first one image, then up to four occurring and again melting and decreasing. And in the end, we have just one uh, normal image. You can do this also at home, of course. And um, you can look through this wine glass to identify uh, two or three or even four images. That's it in principle, just some historical remarks. The, I developed this method around 85 uh, in the group of my doctoral advisor, Shorestal, who unfortunately passed already away. At first, there was no computer algebra available and I used my home computer and a pen plotter for my thesis. This beautiful ray plot um, on the right-hand side uh, took uh, roughly 29 hours uh, on the plotter 
And with Maple, it's just a split of a second. However, this was a very first nice result. Thank you for your attention. Hi, thank you, Thomas. That was a, a very interesting topic and exciting uh, presentation. Um, now I'd like to open to any questions um, from the audience, if there are any. We have one minute and 32 seconds. Okay, I, um, I have uh, one pre prepared question um, that, um, where is it? Uh, could you give any details of uh, the reference uh, K Chang from 1981? Um, there was a question, um, uh, we were interested in understanding the source of the lens equation. Um, yeah, it's in principle, it's her PhD thesis. And uh, you find uh, in principle at the end or in my, my worksheet, you find a reference uh, to a nature article where uh, she and Shorestal explain the details behind. But I would be happy if you send me an email to, to send you a complete reference list. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, there's one more question from the audience. Uh, is, is the ray tracing, um, being packed into a library to use on different applications? Uh, of course, there are ray tracing packages for visualization. Um, if you have um, transparent objects in a room or so, but um, this here in uh, what I did in Maple is not in a package. And the astrophysical application is as far as I know, also not in, an, in a package. But uh, I think the ideas are quite simple. If you really want to make visualizations of rooms with transparent articles, um, it's a, a good idea to look for, for this package available uh, somewhere in the net. You can set, I can try to find it out and send you if you send me an email. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question, have the results been used to validate numerical solutions? Um, Mm. Um, this is complicated. Uh, my my um, uh, implicit function imaging model uh, was used uh, quite often just to visualize uh, gra gravitational lens situations. And uh, in principle, the idea came from analyzing the numerical scheme. And we found that uh, when I started uh, this idea, inverting the lens equation for every point of the source, and we found that uh, such a niveau plot or iso photon plot uh, just does the complete trick. But we use it for modeling gravitational lenses. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll wrap, wrap up this uh, presentation now and go, move on to the next one. Yeah. So thank you, Thomas. Uh, yeah. The next speaker is Kays Haddad uh, presenting um, in collaboration with Edgardo Chapterab about Feynman integral a uh, symbolic Feynman integral evaluation in Maple. Please go ahead, Case. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to introduce to you guys uh, Feynman integral, which I've been working on with Edgardo Chapterab. And the purpose is to evaluate symbolically one loop Feynman integrals using Maple. Uh, so just to begin, I'll try to answer really briefly the question what is a Feynman integral? Uh, so physicists are often interested in describing the properties and interactions of fundamental particles, such as electrons, photons, and quarks, amongst others. And uh, quantum field theory provides us with a framework to do so. Um, and observables that we can uh, measure in detectors uh, are going to be related to scattering amplitudes. So scattering amplitudes themselves are the fundamental observables of quantum field theories. And the way that you can think about them is as a probability amplitude for a given physical process to occur. Uh, and so practically speaking, when we compute uh, scattering amplitudes, we do so in a perturbative expansion, uh, which we also call a loop expansion. And the loop expansion can be uh, written down pretty nicely in terms of uh, so-called Feynman diagrams. Uh, so as an example of this, uh, we can take a look at electron-electron scattering through photon exchange. Uh, so the three first orders in the perturbative expansion look something like this. Uh, on the left-hand side, here we have a tree-level diagram, which contains no loops inside the diagram. And this is going to be the leading order contribution to the scattering amplitude. Next, we have a one-loop diagram, which contributes at next leading order. And third here, we have a two loop diagram, which contributes at next to next leading order. We can continue in this way. Uh, so the number of closed loops is inside the diagram uh, corresponds precisely to the loop order of the, of the diagram. And uh, a bit more specifically from a computational perspective, uh, the number of loops of a diagram 
corresponds to the number of, more, of uh, momenta that are not fixed by momentum conservation. And uh, these momenta cannot appear in the final result, so we have to integrate them out. And the integrals that result from integrating out the loop momenta uh, are precisely uh, what are called Feynman integrals. So uh, already in Maple, there is a bit of a pipeline going from the interaction Lagrangian to obtain the full uh, scattering amplitude. Uh, so there's the module Feynman diagrams, which Davide will speak about uh, shortly, which takes you from the interaction Lagrangian to uh, the unintegrated amplitude, which is also sometimes called the integrand. And then if we restrict ourselves to one loop, so just basically this middle diagram here, we can perform the integration using Feynman integral and go from the unintegrated amplitude to the fully integrated amplitude at one loop order. So let me get a little bit more specific now uh, about what the Feynman integrals actually look like at one loop. So they take a schematic form like this, where the function f in the numerator is going to be a polynomial function of the loop momentum. So it can either be trivial, uh, just a one, or it can be a scalar function of the loop momentum, or it can have open Lorentz uh, four vector indices. Um, and the denominator here, we have products of so-called uh, Feynman propagators. And each of these propagators in our implementation so far is going to be quadratic in the loop momentum. So uh, the number L here counts the number of propagators that we have in our, uh, in our diagram. Um, and it's actually, it corresponds to how many vertices are attached to a loop in the diagram. So if we have, uh, for example, this tadpole topology on the left-hand side down here, uh, this has just one vertex connecting to the loop, and therefore we have just one propagator in our Feynman integral. The bubble has two vertices and therefore two uh, propagators. The triangle has three and the box has four, and we can keep going in this way. So in the Feynman integral uh, module, uh, we define a Feynman integral by using this inert form uh, of Feynman integral. And a couple of remarks that I'll make uh, is that first of all, the loop momentum is always gonna be denoted by a lowercase p and some integer subscript, whereas the external momenta are capital uh, p's with integer, su integer subscripts as well. So here I have to find a scalar bubble integral. Uh, and the next remark that I'll make is that the integral has been defined in four space-time dimensions. Uh, so basically, we can set up the integral in whatever dimension we want, but it's always going to be equal to the uh, dimension of the physics environment, which by default is four, but we can change this using uh, a, a specific command. Okay, and what we actually want to do is to uh, evaluate this integral. Uh, so if you're, if you're familiar with Feynman integrals, you might already know that the bubble integral in four space-time dimensions is actually divergent. And the way that physicists get around this is by employing something called dimensional regularization. Um, and what we do in dimensional regularization is we are actually going to evaluate the integral away from four dimensions, and then we're going to analytically continue our result uh, to four space-time dimensions. So Feynman integral is going to be computing the integral in dimensional regularization. And what this means is that our result is going to be expressed in terms of this parameter epsilon here, which uh, basically just parameterizes the deviation away from the uh, space-time dimension of our interest. Uh, okay, and with Feynman integral, the evaluation is uh, very simple. Um, all we have to do is pass the, the bubble integral to a function called evaluate, and we see on the right-hand side here, we've evaluated the integral. Um, so when we designed Feynman integral, we wanted to give it a lot of uh, pedagogical applications as well. Um, and basically, uh, the way that this looks is that we have several keywords that can be passed to evaluate. Uh, which will interrupt the evaluation of the integral at intermediate steps so that uh, basically a step-by-step -step solution can be, uh, can be seen. Okay, so the example I just gave you is an example of a scalar integral. Uh, and what a scalar integral means is basically just that we don't have any open Lorentz indices in the numerator. Um, so here are basically more general examples of scalar integrals. So if we set A here to be an even integer, then in the numerator, we're, we're not gonna have any uh, open Lorentz indices. Um, so in this first row here, we have a general scalar integral corresponding to tadpole diagrams. Uh, so just one propagator in the denominator. Uh, next row is the bubble topology for uh, scalar integrals. Next, we have triangles with three propagators and boxes with four, and we can continue in this way. Uh, so this is to be contrasted with tensor integrals, which are integrals which do have open Lorentz indices. So here I give you an example of a uh, rank two tensor bubble integral. So we see that we have two open Lorentz indices of the numerator. Uh, and here, because this is a, a square of the Lorentz of the, of the loop momentum, uh, there are no open Lorentz indices and this does not contribute to the tensor structure. Uh, so practically in computations, 
uh, whenever we want to compute a tensor integral, what we're actually going to do is reduce it, uh, express it in terms of scalar integrals. Uh, there are several algorithms to do this, uh, but one of them, and the one which we've employed in Feynman integral, is called the Pasarino Veltman reduction. Uh, and there is a specific command that will uh, apply the, the Pasarino Veltman reduction to express tensor integrals in terms of scalar integrals. And this command is called tensor reduce. And again, with an eye towards pedagogy, uh, there are keywords that can be passed to tensor reduce such that uh, intermediate results can be uh, obtained. So let me show you an example then of how to compute uh, a rank two bubble integral. So in this case here, I've uh, removed the P1 squared and for simplicity's sake, I've also removed one of the masses from the propagators. Uh, so the first thing that you would do if you were computing this by hand is you would reduce uh, this, um, this integral into uh, in terms of scalar integrals. So if I just pass rank two bubble to tensor reduce, I see here that I have, uh, I'm left with only Feynman integrals with trivial numerators. So all the numerators here are just one and I have no more Lorentz structure inside the integration. Um, okay. And now I still want to evaluate these uh, remaining scalar integrals. So I can just pass the output of tensor reduce to evaluate. Um, and I see now in my result that I have no more Feynman integrals left over. So all of the integrals, all the integration has been done. Uh, and actually, I just showed you a bit of a roundabout way. Um, if you pass a tensor integral to evaluate, it will automatically call tensor reduce. Uh, so you don't need to call it manually. Uh, so if I just pass rank two bubble to evaluate, uh, you can see that there are no um, there are no Feynman integrals left over, and modulo some uh, rearrangement of the result. This is precisely equal to the result um, to the output here in equation five. Uh, and yeah, that's basically all I want to say for the summary. So I showed you a couple of examples of how to use uh, Feynman integral first on a scalar integral and then on a uh, rank two tensor integral as well. And uh, yeah, um, I'll take any questions now. Thank you, Case. Um, any questions from the audience? Uh, here's one. Um, is this toolbox capable to perform serious realistic large scale symbolic computations? Of course, with proper uh, hardware, I guess, computing cluster, or is it intended mainly for educational purposes? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, it depends kind of on which, uh, which calculations you're talking about. If you want, for example, calculations at the LHC, uh, those are typically higher loop calculations. And at this point, uh, we have not implemented any higher loop uh, implementation, uh, any higher loop capabilities into this package. Um, so for now at the one loop level, I would say it's mostly for, for pedagogy. Um, it's also useful if you wanna, for example, renormalize something up to one loop. Um, this, this is something, this is an advantage of this package or for example, numerical implementations is that you can isolate the divergent part uh, of the integral by isolating the one over epsilon poles. Um, so in terms of one loop renormalization, that's also something else that you can do. But large scale, something that will be useful in experiments, uh, I think you need something that's higher precision and preferably, uh, or probably also numerical in terms of uh, experiments. Okay, thank you. Um, I had an, a similar question that you kind of just answered. Um, and I think we're kind of running out of time. We should get on to the next speaker. So perhaps more questions um, at the end for Case. Um, can we move on then? So the next speaker is uh, David Polvara um, and he will be speaking on um, uh, physics, uh, Feynman diagrams, a maple package for the computation of scattering amplitudes. And I should stay, say this is also a, a collaboration with Edgardo Chapterat. Go ahead. Okay, thank you for inviting me to give this uh, talk at this nice conference. And today I would like to speak about a package in collaboration with uh, Edgardo Chapterat that I developed with Edgardo in 2019 and it is still uh, going on. Uh, hi Edgardo, if you are uh, between the attendees. And uh, the package, uh, the big topic is the scattering uh, of uh, um, particles in quantum physics. Um, so when uh, we are studying uh, classical physics, basically when you have a scattering of uh, particles that you can imagine like pool balls, after the collisions, uh, you still have the same set of uh, incoming particles. Uh, but in quantum physics, that is not the case. So if you start with some uh, beams of protons, for example, that you can collide in some large hadron collider like LHC, after the collision, you can have a bunch of different outcomes. 
and each one of these outcomes come with certain uh, probability. So this package basically is something to um, figure out what these probabilities are. So let me start uh, uh, with an example in which I restart uh, Maple with my physics package, uh, which is the big environment of physics. And then very, I call uh, Feynman diagrams, which is my uh, sub package. And in this setup, I need to define what is basically my model that I want to study. So I want to study a toy model with just one kind of particle that I call phi. Usually in the universe, you have many different kinds of particles. You have electrons, quarks, uh, photons. I want to just study a simple model with just one particle to explain uh, what the package can do. Uh, and then I define a Lagrangian which describe the interactions of this particle. So I define L to be phi to the three. And what I want to compute is given a certain set of incoming particles. So I have n uh, incoming particles that come with certain momenta, p1 until pn. You can imagine the momenta are as uh, the velocities of your particle, if you want, if you're not familiar with this language. And you want to compute what is the probability after this particle collide to have a certain set of outgoing particles. And the set of incoming and outgoing particles can have a different number of particles. So the important thing is that they respect the energy conservation according to uh, relativity. And the problem is a combinatorial problem. So here is the main um, command, Feynman diagrams. I define my Lagrangian L1 to be that one in equation two, and I define incoming particle phi and outgoing particle phi and phi. So what is the probability given a certain particle that it decays into two other particles? At zero loop, you just have one diagram, which is this one. And I use uh, this command, use interaction equal false to give you an idea of what it's doing. So there is just a single vertex in which you have uh, a particle incoming with momentum P1 and two particles outgoing with momenta P2 and P3. If you want exactly know what this vertex is, you just remove uh, use interaction equal false. So you just remove this line. And what you get is exactly the expression lambda which is uh, the same lambda contained in your interaction Lagrangian. And similarly, you can do the same for more number of incoming and outgoing particles. So a number of loops equals zero. You have uh, that this is the topology of diagram uh, you have. And once again, you can use interaction equal false to see what's going on. So there are two vertices, one given by this guy and the other one, which is given by this guy. So in the first vertex, you see there are two particles incoming with momentum P1 and P2. In the other vertex, there are two particles outgoing with momenta uh, P3 and P4. So these are the first two particles incoming, these are the two particles outgoing. But then you can also arrange the different moments in different uh, manners inside these vertices. So that in the end, you get three uh, algebraic expressions for this topology uh, that correspond basically uh, to um, the amplitude. So once again, if you remove use interaction equal false, you get uh, the expressions uh, for, uh, for um, for your amplitude. Uh, you can define also Lagrange, for example, containing derivative. In this case, there are uh, two derivatives that are contracted, where indices are contracted. And once again, you can ask for the vertices. In this case, uh, you still you also have some powers of your momenta that are here due to the fact that you added this derivative in the uh, interaction Lagrange. Uh, you can also ask for loops. For example, this is related with the talk of Kais. And the program can return these loops. This is a triangle. Uh, and this is the expressions for the Feynman integral associated to this triangle. So the program uh, returns this algebraic expression. And then the computation of this expression is the next step. That is uh, what the talk of skies has covered. Or if, uh, if you insert uh, zero loops, uh, for example, you can ask a uh, higher number of particles. So this is your diagram with five external legs. So there are two incoming particles and three outgoing particles. Once again, your particles are your external legs. And uh, you can arrange the momentum in different ways inside in these external legs in such a way that uh, your amplitude is uh, this long output that once again then can be computed basically. Um, so here I put some uh, different examples. So let me go to an example that has not covered in my pre-recorded um, in my pre-recorded video, which is a QCD. So this is a more complicated example. There are more different kinds of uh, particles that I define here. So I define two quarks that I call QB and QT, are the bottom and the top quark, and the GL, we stay uh, for uh, uh, gluons. 
in my setup. And then I can define basically uh, different Lagrangians, different kind of interaction. This interaction describe uh, basically how the quark uh, bottom interact uh, with itself and interact with the gluon. And similarly, I do the same for the top and I do the same for the gluon itself. So there are different kinds of interaction that enter in a QCD type of uh, Lagrangian. So I define the QCD Lagrangian as the sum over all these ty different types of interaction where here all these uh, labels, uh, uh, all these letters are different kind of vertices uh, that uh, basically lives in some representation of uh, SU3 and uh, of space time. And you can ask once again uh, to have uh, your diagram. So this is the decay of one gluon in two quark bottom and anti bottom at zero loop. Uh, this is uh, uh, your diagram. You can ask for example, for one loop what's going on. In this case, you have two different uh, uh, possibilities for your diagrams. Or for example, you can include uh, uh, gluon gluon into gluon gluon at zero loop, uh, this is uh, your amplitudes. And then there are uh, different kind of functionalities. For example, you can change the gauge uh, or for example, uh, you can change the number of loops. So for example, if you inset the number of loops uh, equal one, this will take uh, a, bit, a longer amount of time, but uh, after some time, the program probably will return uh, some output. So let's see how much it takes. I never try this, probably it takes some more time. Okay, let's compute and then see. The reason why it takes so much time is because there are many indices and the program is trying to contract all the different kinds of indices in the correct way. Um, so in conclusion, okay, this is the output. So it's a super long output uh, because uh, uh, the, the QCD interactions contains a lot of different uh, terms. So in conclusion, what I did was to present uh, this package that can handle uh, uh, arbitrary interaction Lagrangian with no restriction of the number of fermions, for example, inside the vertices on the number of derivatives of different kinds of indices. This is my timer and uh, uh, returns an algebraic expressions uh, for this output, which is uh, written in a kind of paper and pencil uh, way. So uh, this has been my, in my talk. Uh, I leave here uh, the conclusion since uh, I'm already out of time. And if there are any questions, I will be happy to try to reply. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you very much, uh, David. Um, that was very impressive. Are there any questions from the audience? Probably to stop sharing to see. Okay, I have a question. Um, there is um, something in Mathematica called the Fein, uh, Fine Arts Package. Um, it's Feynman. Uh, com compared with that, what are the advantages of the Maple Physics uh, Feynman Diagrams Package? Yes, I can try to explain. Um, Fine arts is a program that works well, very well in Mathematica, uh, but uh, it's difficult to input arbitrary interaction in fine art. Basically, you, you should define a new um, model uh, in a file, and uh, this is not easy to be done. While I think it, uh, this package is quite easy because, uh, it, for example, if you want to define your setup, not just one particle, but uh, two different kinds of particles, like uh, phi and eta, uh, for example, you can define a new interaction Lagrangian in this way. I don't know. Let me call this the lambda uh, phi theta x to the two. So I added basically another field in my interaction. And this is uh, really simple, it's as you do basically with paper and pencil. So if you want, for example, now defining an amplitude for this new file, a uh, new field theta, or this is, oh, there are two eta, sorry, like this one you have your, uh, your diagram and then you can ask for the amplitude for this new uh, eta. So it's, it's very simple to input new models. Uh, this thing is not present for, uh, I, 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 I think this is not uh, easy in Mathematica, for example, in, uh, in the package fine art. And the output is expressed then in a, in a way which is very similar to what we do with paper and pencil and then is inside the Maple environment. So you can go forward computing things inside Maple without using other different uh, language. In Mathematica, then you, you should use a form calc or uh, a kind of Fortran uh, 
kind of coding languages. Well, here in, inside Maple, you have the advantage, the advantage that you can stay inside Maple and use package already existing in Maple. Okay, thank you, David. That's what I would say. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we're out of time for this one. So we'll, we'll, thank you very much. And we'll go on to the next um, presentation, which is uh, from William Fallardo. Um, and it's about the Maple implementation of the SKU PD PBW extensions. And uh, please go ahead, William. William, you are still muted. Can you unmute your microphone, please? Maybe I can do that. Hello to all of you. It's a pleasure to share this work with you. The implementation of the SQP extensions, uh, the functionality of the library. In this brief talk, we will present the SQP library Developing Maple that, can lo that allows to use this QP value extensions to compute possible uh, applications of the grounded basis and a wide variety of homological applications. What is this is QP value extension? And is QP value extension A is a ring of polynomial type that called that a cheats are free, hard to set of A, that it cheats elements, it's one, it's n, A, so that the monomials of these elements is arc like basis of A. And that it cheats computing, compute commuting relations uh, between variables and between variables with coefficient in these ways, in these ways. This is the definition possible to the SQP and the sanction. In this case, A is the not is the not in this way, and A is said as SQP and the sanction of R. R is the is called the coefficient ring of A. The library. The SPLU library is a collection of packages to perform computes with SQP extension, not already now system uh, computations with SQP extensions. E and the importance of the, of the implementations uh, is the coefficients on our non commutative polynomials can be in a ring not necessarily in a, in a field. The SPL array consists of the following packages, ring tools and speed alloy tools. The ring tools package allows to define the structure of the ring R of coefficient of the SQP value extension A. The speed alloy tools package is a collection of functions that can allow to define the structure of the SQP extension and perform basic computes with polynomials operations with vectors or matrices on SQP extensions. SQL ring packet. This is a constituent by some subclass of SQP extensions that are predefined in the library and with which it is possible to detect computations in the same way as if they had been explicitly defined. This is this, the type of these predefined structures in the package. The parity of structures that can be defined in quite and may not only be based on algebra structure, but also rings not necessarily algebra. The main package, is with Grunner, is a collection of functions to relate it to the Grunner basis of the SQP extensions. Uh, the main routine is the 
which Berger agreed for stupid sanctions to the left and side right. In this package also was implemented some homological applications between these the functions of this package. To continue a, a small sample, this part. Leg A, the skew polynomial ring of the endomorphism tree. Arc, the coefficient is the complex. Three is this function. We define the ring. Find the ring. Is defining the extension, the relation of the sigma, the sigma and delta. And a, and a sample instance of the product of matrices, random matrices, and one and two on the product. In this extension A, in this extension A. A second part, a very example, we will define station sigma A in these variables with relations with scientific sigmas and deltas in these ways. Note that the coefficient ring is the A of the sample default. Here is defined the structure, the relations of the variables, and the relations of sigmas and deltas. Some applications of the ESPWA grounded package with the extension C defined before, with the division algorithm, the element. In this, in this idea, and left case and right case, the Wisberger algorithm, the left and right case for ideas, or modes, left and right case, or an instance with the, with the memory, the memory chip problem. Other applications, for example, the left inverse matrix or right inverse matrix, computing of left or right CCG, computing free resolution of leg CMO, uh, computing the torque and edge by modes. Uh, computing a minimal presentation or the like a mode and the project dimension of the leg mode is a view uh, big uh, instance of the lib library. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you very much, William. And uh, we have time for uh, any questions from the audience. Um, so I was just going to ask um, one question. Um, um, you explained in the talk, there, there's many examples of skew PD PBW extensions in mathematical physics. Um, were you able to use, or do you have any examples where you use this software to help analyze uh, such problems or solve such problems from mathematical physics? Excuse me, you, you can't keep it uh, slow. You? Okay, um, sorry about that. Um, you, you mentioned in the talk there, there's many examples of um, skew PBW extensions in mathematical physics. Do you have um, some examples where you were able to use your software um, to analyze or to help solve 
these types of practical problems. Yes, uh, are, uh, there, there is, there is teach, uh, some applications, uh, for example, in multilinear systems, and application of, of physics, but uh, some status algorithm relative to the computation in, in, in variables, but uh, uh, it's not not so so the application is not so so beautiful in, in, the, in the in the context of the the academic, but it's very important the general relation or the commutation of variables with the coefficient c i j in the in the relations. Mm. In these relations, it's very important the CIJ. CIJ is the is the difference with the other estimate. But in the academic, it's very important to uh, to have uh, uh, computation with these structures, the applications are some like uh, bonus, some uh, in, in the in the physics, but it's not it's not stronger stronger becomes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we are very tight for time. We have to end in uh, three minutes or so, two minutes maybe. Um, we quick question for Thomas Schramm. Um, uh, thank you very much, William Fajardo. Um, we'll just uh, open it up to questions for anyone else. Um, there was one question that was asked previously for Thomas Schramm. I just want to: what which Maple uh, version did you use for your work? The new library was relocating uh, in version 2016, but is working in in the in the actual 21. Okay, uh, actually, okay, that <laughs> that question was meant for Thomas. Um, actually, I don't know if he's still here. I don't see him anyway. Um, so maybe he can answer that privately. Um, but thank you, William. Um, and I'm not sure we have any more time for any other questions. Um, and they're not, I don't see any other questions coming in from the audience either. Um, yeah. I think that, well, I did perhaps have one uh, extra prepared question for Kay's Haddad. Um, if you can make this really brief of an answer, um, the Passerino Veltman reduction is known to suffer from instabilities in certain regions of the phase space of the external momenta. How does Feynman integral cope with these instabilities? Uh, yeah, so when you, uh, when you're solving for, uh, this, these tensor integrals in terms of scalar integrals, uh, what you get is a matrix which is made up of kinematic invariants that you have to invert. And um, if, uh, if you have numerical uh, values for these kinematic invariants, um, it's possible in certain regions of the phase space that maybe these kinematic invariants are close to zero. So when you invert them, you get something that's very, very large. And you can lose numerical stability that way. Uh, the way that, uh, I mean, this isn't an issue for us, basically, because uh, we're doing everything symbolically. So the result in the end is expressed just in terms of these kinematical invariants without having, uh, without depending on their actual numerical value. So we don't have any kind of, uh, um, so, so yeah, the computation is reliable. It's fast, uh, regardless of the uh, specific kinematics of the process. Austin, I believe you're muted. Uh, with that, uh, we'll 
uh, finish this session and please thank you very much for the presenters and we'll continue the discussion in the lounge afterwards if there is any further discussion. Thank you very much.